Hey everyone, this is George Kroos, and this is the first episode in four parts of the highlights from the Innovators Mindset Podcast from 2023. And I like to put these highlights uh, together at the end of the year because I think it it's a great way to kind of connect and see some of the great learning that was shared by my guests um, over time. But I also, I know that sounds weird. I don't want to actually expose any new guests to these time slots in December because a lot of people don't watch and so or don't listen. And so if anyone is, you know, there are a little bit shorter snippets of what people are sharing and connecting. And so um, I know that sounds uh, like a weird thing to say because I just don't want to bring anyone on who's maybe never had exposure to this audience and then them not get many listens or views because uh no one's really listening to stuff and as you shouldn't be you know if you listen to this right now i hope you're doing it during a time where you just maybe need some time on your own time to just kind of chill out and so um i just want to kind of honor uh my guests the people that take a time out of their day that if you're gonna do little views i'd rather it be for me um than, than someone who maybe has never actually been on the podcast before and so these four episodes that are coming up, they're actually split into four. And this is the first one. And they kind of have themes to that. And I, I'm going to give a little bit of, of thinking. And I've actually recorded, weirdly enough, I've recorded the other three. This is the last one recording, but it's the first one you're hearing. So they're based on four themes that are connected to the innovator's mindset. And the first one is problem finders and solvers. And I'll be talking about that in a second. Uh, the second one is being reflective. The third one is about resiliency. And the fourth one is being observant. And so what I'll do with these four podcasts, I'll do a little opening, share some insights, share some thinking, and then turn it over to my guests so that you get a little bit of a George <laughs> thinking. I don't want to say wisdom because I don't really think I got any, but just some, some of my learning. And hopefully it will help you kind of, as you head into this new year, you know, trying some new things, really kind of trying to grow, whether it's personally, professionally. And that's something I really pride myself on this podcast. I think um, a lot of times you go to a podcast because, you know, you're in education, you probably listen to this if you're in education, but I, I just don't think we need to talk about education all the time in education. I think we just need to chill and relax. And sometimes we'll talk about education. Sometimes we'll talk about other things because I think there's so many things that it, when you get so caught up in being a teacher, being a, a principal, being an administrator, uh, you forget to be a person. And then we, then all of a sudden we're overworked and um, it just it just seems to be a lot. So I, I'm sharing a little personal advice, a little professional advice, and kind of mixing the two. And um, this episode, the, the theme is about problem finders and solvers. And I know I've been talking a lot about my marathon. And one of the things I think is really funny is that What's the point of running a marathon if you don't tell everyone you're running a marathon, right? And I haven't finished it, so these could be a huge flop, right? And I've, I've had some struggles. And I've actually had some struggles um, in the last little while. I pulled my hamstring, had a very severe issue. And so um, I'm trying to get back. I'm actually, uh, as I'm recording this, I'm about to run the Orlando Half Marathon as a training race. And uh, I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it. And I, sh I should be okay now. But I, I hurt my hamstring really bad. And the reason it has to do with problem finders and solvers is sometimes the problem we identify is actually not the problem. The problem that I have right now is I actually have strained my hamstring. That's the one I saw. But the problem I actually do have is I don't stretch. <laughs> I don't warm up. I just go. And so... This happened and I was so upset about it because I was just, I just had so much momentum, so much pace and I really been pushing myself. But if you don't really take care of yourself as you're pushing yourself, then this tends to happen. So instead of saying like, hey, the problem is my hamstring. Okay, well, I can fix it, do whatever I need to do, get back out there. But if I continue on the same path, it's just going to be an issue all the time. The problem is I need to really kind of figure out about my warming up about my you know stretching you know before after all of those things and so every time something new comes up that's an issue I kind of like try to take a step back and say okay what is the actual problem here right and I think this is a really important thing in school and we identify certain things we, we want to kind of jump on bandwagons and just say like oh this is the issue but if we kind of pull back and we kind of step back we we might see something a little bit bigger than what we realized or something that, you know, is a better solve. Like a, a really good example. 
uh, when you think about all the problems that with mental health, emotional well-being, um, physical health with educators, or what a lot of people do is they'll like they'll, and I've mentioned this a million times, they will overwork you, and then say, hey, but we were going to add yoga to the end of the PD day, and it's like. The problem is not we need more yoga. The problem is don't overwork us. And so when you take a step back, it's like, hey, are we actually creating the issue that we're trying to solve? And this is like so true with so many things in life, whether it's politics, whether it's education, is that a lot of times we are trying to solve problems we created ourselves. And that's true in education is that some of the problems that we have, we're identifying the wrong problem. And so when you take a step back, say, what is the bigger issue here? The bigger issue here is not that we need more yoga. The bigger issue here is that we need to get to a place where we don't, <laughs> we don't need to do yoga. I'm not saying if you do yoga, there's something wrong with you. I'm just saying, and I'm a big stretch guy now, so I'm, I'm all for yoga. But that's not the point. Are we getting to a place where we're identifying the wrong problem and, and putting band-aids on things? Or are we actually really addressing something so that moving forward, we all become better through the process? And so it's not just about identifying the problem. When, it, when I shared about problem finders and solvers in the innovator's mindset, it's not being one or the other. It's actually being both. It's identifying the problem. What is the issue that we're really trying to deal with? And then finding the solutions. And you know, that little example in my own um, wellness journey, it was like, okay, what is the bigger issue here? How do I pull back? see what it is and long-term become better of it, not just do a temporary fix. Because if I do a temporary fix, not only can the issue come back, it could be worse. So that's kind of my little opening. Maybe you got something out of it, maybe you didn't. But if you didn't get something out of it, I promise you over the next few weeks, a um, few episodes, you'll get some really great stuff uh, from my guests at minimum and hopefully a little bit for me. But um, I really appreciate you being here. Appreciate you taking your time out of maybe your holidays, out of your super busy time of the year to spend some time with me. And I just, before I even get into it, I'm just so appreciative of you here. So thank you for spending time with me. You have no idea how much this means to me. Uh, and I know the guests I have ahead will provide some amazing value for you, whether it's personal or professional or both. Welcome back to a highlight episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast for the year 2023. I, I came out there to speak and Keith, before I even entered, he sent me such a nice email and welcomed me before I got there. And I, I was blessed to be there and actually meet Keith. And I sent a little video to your, to your community and your staff. And so uh, I want to give your staff, I know, cause they, they're going through a lot of changes too. a little shut up. Right. So to everyone working out media, cause you know, a lot of times it's focused on the person opening it, but all of you are opening the school this year. It's not, it's not just you on your own. So, uh, Keith, thanks for taking the time out of your super busy schedule. I know you got a million things to do, but I know people can learn from you, and that's why I really wanted to um, have you on the podcast. So if you can just kind of tell everyone who you are, what you do today, and kind of how you got to that point, I think that's a great place to start. Sure. Thanks, George. It's great to, to be on your program today. So, um, yeah, my name is Keith Fickle, and this is my 30th year in education. Uh been in Fort Bend ISD here in Southwest Houston most of my career. And it's I've moved from being a teacher, a classroom teacher. I was a band director for about 17 years. And then I moved into the ranks of administration um, from being a band director into being an assistant principal, uh, an associate principal, uh, and now a, a principal. So I've been through I've, the only areas I've not taught. I've not taught elementary, but I've taught middle school most of my career and been a middle school administrator most of my career. So um, I did spend a year of being an assistant principal at a really great school here in our district called Willow Ridge High School, a school with a lot of spirit and pride. Once an eagle, always an eagle. Go ahead, Willow Ridge. <laughs> um, Got to give my shout out to my friends over there right. at Willow Ridge High School. Um, so, but this is my, really my first year back, kind of in the in the in the high school realms. Um, so, um, but I've been, I was the principal at Sugarland middle school, uh, for, for six years. And then the last year or so prior to the, this school year, I, I spent, I guess, building a community and, and working with uh, students and staff and parents and building, uh, working slowly at building our, our community here, uh, 
to launch Almeda Crawford High School, which is named after an incredible uh, veteran educator of 40 plus years at another uh, campus here in the district, which is known as the flagship, the original high school in Fort Bend. That's Dulles High School. They're the Vikings. But Mrs. Crawford was an English teacher there for close to 40 years and uh, still living in the Houston area. And uh, what a great testament that this school is for her uh, and to give back to her and to her family for the impact that she has made on th literally thousands and thousands of, of, of families over the course of 40 years. So here we are opening a brand new high school. We open on August the 9th with about 600 kids in grades nine and 10. And everybody's new to one another. They're new to me. I'm new to them. The staff is new to one another. The students maybe are a little bit, um, you know, not necessarily new to one another because we were relieving a, a high school that desperately needed the, the relief for, for overcrowding because we're, we're right. growing so, so strongly here. But uh you know, we're, we're focusing on um, direction first and speed later, or one of our values that we're, we're working on. We don't have a set of formal core values yet, um, but one of them is that we're working with is this idea of valuing direction over speed. So, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to be in, you know, two or three weeks, what other people may have experienced at a school that's been open for 13 or 15 years, right? right. So, and they they had to have their Genesis story. So this year is, you know, the Genesis story for, for Almeda Crawford High School. Go Chargers. So tell, okay, I, I got to ask this. I like, I, I didn't know that part about who the school is named after. I didn't know that. And like, I wish that happened more, you, you know? So there's so many schools being named after people. This is the first time I've ever heard one being named after a teacher, which I, I love, which is incredible. So like, how did that, how did that come about? Like, how, how did that happen? That's such a, that's awesome. I love that. I, I wish that would happen more. And so this is one of the reasons I want to have you on the podcast is I hope somebody hears this in another school district. It's like, yeah, we should start naming our schools after teachers that taught here. Like that's, that's amazing. So how did that come about? So formerly the school, this school uh, I'm at, Crawford High School is known as high school number 12. So we're the 12th high school in the district. We're in a district of 80,000 kids. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was named principal in, I guess, late March of 2021, uh, right after we had our little ice Mageddon thing here in Texas when the everything froze. <laughs> right. Power grid kind of nearly wow. failed. Um, I forgot it was called that. I forgot it. that was the name of it. It's, it is anything but cold right now, let me right. tell you. Right. So, of course, you were here, so you know. I'm I know. It is, it is hot. So, um, around that same time, maybe March in that year, not too long after I was uh, named principal, the district always, our, our district's protocol is to gather input from the community and stakeholders about, like, what would be, you know, a great name for whatever school. So, Crawford High School is the high school that's opening now, but we also have two elementary schools that are opening, that opened along with us. And that's Ferguson Elementary and Butcher Elementary. And so for both, all three schools, they put together, they solicited names of, of people uh, from the community who they think would be worthy. And as you would imagine, all kinds of names from every walk of life, right. education, medicine, arts, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and they settled on, after having a committee uh, work on, you know, parsing through all this, the, the suggestions, and they they arrived at Almeda Crawford um, because, number one, there had not been a secondary, or excuse me, a high school named after a female uh, in Fort Bend, so it was fitting uh, for that. Now, we do have another secondary school that's named after a female, and that's Krista McAuliffe uh, okay. Middle School. That's what actually feeds my previous campus, Willow Ridge, and it's a great campus. So, But that was a real big honor for... Um, for Mrs. Crawford and her family to wow. have been named that, uh, to have the school rather named after them. So we had to stop calling it High School 12, and now we're calling it Almeda Crawford High School. And um, Much so, better name. Much better yeah. name than High School 12. Absolutely. High School 12 sounds like a sci-fi movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, and I've been blessed over the last probably year and a half uh, after the school was named after her. She yeah. and her family, uh, we have connected. We've met on a couple of occasions Her. Her son Tori and her daughter uh, Rhonda, uh, we've we've met to talk about all kinds of things uh, about the school. We we got their input. In fact, you see behind me on my my I guess my background, you see our campus logo and the colors. So she was an integral, and she and her family were an I integral part of, of coming up with not only the colors and the color scheme, but also the the mascot 
our students uh, were involved in, in those selections and, and not just the selections, but also the design of the logo itself. So she and her family were in all of those meetings. And so what you see kind of behind me, I'll, I'll be like the weatherman and move out of the way here. You see that our lightning bolt C, uh, that's kind of like for being charged up. And then you yeah. got the horse. That's kind of this idea of forging ahead. So if you look inside the, the horse's head, you can actually see lightning bolts within the hair. So um, yeah. it's got this, this this idea of energy because Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Crawford's thing is she brings a lot of energy to the classroom. Um, okay. You know, so it's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a full disclosure moment here. I was, I was actually seeing the horse behind you. And I was thinking that's kind of a bummer that you already have that because like that would have been a great opportunity to like build it with students. So I, I wasn't going to ask that. And then I'm so glad you said that. I was like, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Cause that's how it should be. Right. Like there's, there's a certain ownership when we actually have a say in building a new school that it's not just, you know, somebody sent it off to somebody and we had no part of the decision. Now there's some ownership over that too. The, the other thing I, I, I love about this story is a lot of times when schools are named after people, it's after people that are no longer with us. And I'm all about, you know, um, you know, giving these accolades to people while they still can appreciate them, not after the fact. And, and so I love that. And I love that she was part of it. I love your students are part of the design. That's absolutely, I love that. So I hope, I, I truly hope people are listening to that process and, asking themselves, how do we do that as we're creating new spaces? So you are, you actually, tomorrow, you yes. are, there's a conference you said that you're yes. going to, and you told me you're presenting yes. on, I think, two different topics. So I, I want to actually ask you about both of them. So one was on AI yes. you talked about. Tell me, tell me about what you're doing with people tomorrow, because this is obviously a major conversation that's happening in education right now. Oh, it's, it's huge. What are you talking about um, with your group tomorrow? So our spin on the topic tomorrow is using um, AI as a research superpower yeah, and using it in a positive way, not in an I gotcha way, right? right? And if it's introduced in small pieces in all the classes, you know, in low stakes activities like a this or that by showing up some images of AI created things versus non-AI and, you know, talking about prompt engineering to really get that critical thinking to ask it the best questions so that it can get you started, or, you know, tone up, tone down, anything that you've already written, using it in a way that's good. Yeah, well, there's a, this is going to sound weird. There, there is a, there's a South Park episode. Isn't this start off great? There's a South Park episode and the, the, the animation is so terrible on South Park yeah. and it's so minimal that they can actually do stuff that's really relevant and topical yeah. quickly, right? Which is kind of one of the benefits of the, 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 the animation being the way it is. And I'm going to ruin the episode, but they, all the kids figure out ChatGPT and they started actually using it to do their essays. And so they're just writing these high level essays that are just mind blowing. And the teacher, I think it's Mr. Garrison <laughs> is like, Oh my God, my kids are like writing these essays and I'm like having trouble keeping up. And then, uh, basically his partner says like, Hey, have you heard of this chat GPT thing? And so he's using chat GPT to assess the kids, not knowing that they're using <laughs> GPT <laughs> to actually write the essays. <laughs> And it's just kind of like there, there's benefit and there, there's a video I saw, I can't remember. It's a, um, it's a YouTuber. His name is minority mindset. That's what his, uh, it's, I think it's Jasper Singh. He, it's his, his channel is called minority mindset. And he talks about, um, AI being kind of like a second brain mm -hmm. and seeing it as something that not to overtake and replace the stuff that we're doing, but something that we can utilize to kind of help us in this space. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm actually about in the process of like writing a, a blog post about this. There is some benefits of this, but it's also, instead of like just jumping and talking about the AI stuff, I think it's really important for our schools or communities to say like, what are the basic things that we need to, to be able to do? Like, for example, if you use chat GPT, uh, you have to know how to read and write. I think that's kind of an important aspect. And that's like a basic skill that every kid should be able to do. Um, but you also have to know how to ask good questions, right? Yes. So th there's, those are elements of that too.
how much of that is like, like really kind of just understanding the kids actually doesn't happen in the paperwork. Cause I think sometimes we do all of this stuff, write all of this stuff, but sometimes it's just a conversation that it's really hard to, it's really hard to document, but it tells us a lot about the kids. Like, how do you kind of balance that out? Because there is a frustration that a lot of teachers didn't get into the role to do tons of documentation, right? They, they, so how do you kind of, how do you kind of dig into that? Cause I, I know that's a frustration. A lot of people have. Sure. So I, I can kind of answer from two ways. I know as a, um, as a teacher, uh, looking over my IEPs every year and understanding the modifications and the goal could be goals could be overwhelming. Yeah. Um, so just in terms of, in terms of students being successful, like I, I had so many kids in class that their, their IEP wasn't obviously wasn't reflective of who they are as a person. And we, we talked before about a teacher that influenced me. And, and one of the things that I would try to do is really develop that connection, understand that school may not be for, for this kid long-term. So what is right. Um, big part of what we do with secondary students, I was a secondary teacher is develop transition plans to talk about how we get a student from point A to point B, um, after high school. And that's really where I would focus my, you know, uh, focus my attention is how, how are we going to move this child towards their goals? Now you have to, you have to, um, focus on the goals that are laid out in the IEP that are curricular. I mean, you can get into, I don't, Dis I don't disparage parents for uh, for exercising their due process rights in very right. many ways. It's it's why we have the special education programs we do now. But if you don't follow the IEP, you, you get into that situation. As an administrator, though, when you talk about data informed, a lot of times for us, it's 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 leverage like we have. Um, we have a disproportionality um, issue in Edison, and I don't want to get too into the weeds, but it has a lot to do with how the number is calculated. But one thing that you can't argue with is that our students are not, our, our classified students don't demonstrate the same level of pr proficiency in reading. Okay, that's clear. Right. So what, what can we do about that? And when I start to advocate for programs or certifications or, or moving our staff towards, in this case, like kind of the gold standard being like Orton certification for our, all our special ed staff, well, that's costly. Um, but it, it's really clear in what's coming out of, of these assessments. So there's there's kind of two ways to look at it, right? As a teacher, yeah, there's stuff you have to get through, but at the center of that is a human being. For me, it is a secondary teacher, right. the focus what's this child's long-term goal? And then as an administrator, it's it's really more about, okay, what can we do from a more global programmatic perspective to actually use those data and and do something positive for the overall student body of kids? Yeah, and there's something, there's something you said there that kind of sparked a thought that I've been having lately. And I, this is gonna maybe, you know, get me in trouble saying this. I really struggle. I, I it, there, it just irks me. I shouldn't say I hate it, but sometimes I would say that uh, is when I hear uh, teachers referring to kids as scholars, right? Okay. And the yeah. reason I struggle with that is because scholars is a very academic term. It's about academics. It's about going to college. Like it just feels that way. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, there's a little bit of a, a context that basically if, if school is not for you, somehow you're a failure. That's what yeah. I struggle with. Right. In the sense that, do we are we trying to get every kid to be the same kid by the time they leave school? Or are we trying to ensure that every kid knows what their strengths are, what their gifts are, what they're really good at, and that it leads to different things? And I think that to me, like it kind of that was something that kind of stuck out to me. What you said about that is that you know maybe school is not for some for some kids. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking specifically in the inclusion area or the special education area. I'm talking about any kid in any program, but it's like somehow if you don't, if you're not a school kid, if you're not a scholar, somehow mm -hmm. you're a failure. And that mm -hmm. I really struggle with is that it's, it's like, you're, you're saying like, Hey, our kids have different gifts, but you all got to kind of be academic and everything's about academics. And I, I, I make a distinction between, I say, sometimes there's a, there's a huge difference between the idea of our smartest kids and our top academic students, so, because some of our, smartest kids are terrible academically and, but they have gifts that we're not appreciating because they don't fit into the, the little bubbles that we have in school that we say are important. I struggled a little bit when you're thinking about AI is like, well, why should I even write anymore? Because AI can do this and do it way better than me. And it almost yeah, like, but you know, do you know what I mean? Like I, I felt that a little bit cause you're just seeing it like,
Yeah. Right? And so how did, how does someone get over that? Maybe, you know, and I, I feel like, okay, that means I really got to focus on the stuff that only I can share that a, I can't share. That's, you know, somewhat personal. And I think you and I talked about in the last podcast, that really human connection. Yeah. So how do you kind of get people to understand that in a different way when you have access to this stuff, how does it change, you know, our thinking so that we continue doing stuff that pushes our own learning? I think they just have to use it. And, and right. once they try and use it, they're like, oh, that's really good. Oh, that's not so good. Oh, that's good. And then I think when you just see it, you realize, okay, this is a really good start, but I could do, I can make it better. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really just about using it. I I'm know that with my own teachers. So with AI, it's so funny because I don't even, I, they don't know I wrote a book. Some of them do because they, endorse, they I asked some of them to read it first, but um, a lot of them don't know that I wrote a book and it's ironic that I'm like a, I guess, AI expert and right. Right in front of them. Uh, but I try to empower them to be leaders. Like I don't want to stand up at a faculty meeting and them hear me all the time. So right. I know like, okay, Marina's doing this really great thing. Catel's doing this really great thing. And Emma's doing this really great thing. And I'll have a faculty meeting and like do station rotations and the teachers cycle through 10 minutes in each room and see what their colleagues are doing really great. And then it's not me doing it, but also right. they're sharing, hey, I did this. This is what worked. This didn't work. And now the last few minutes, you try it. And so they're walking out of each of those three rooms trying something and saying, okay, this worked, this didn't work. And I think until you put it in their hands and ask them to, to do it, no one will, no one will notice or see it. So I, I'm curious about what you're thinking is on this, because I love that you're giving people opportunity and time to utilize it themselves, because this is something I've been arguing forever is that too often. What we do is we jump straight to the teaching without doing the learning. Like we just say, like, how do we get kids to use this? And it's like, well, you're not even using this. So how do you, if you don't understand it from the viewpoint of a learner, you're going to struggle with this. But this is actually very specifically in the New York area when chat GPT like was all over the place in probably December, maybe even as early as November, 2022, by January, I saw tons of districts in New York, not the state specifically New York city, New York city. blocking it. Man, right. yeah, all of and, New York City is like the largest school district in the country. They yeah. block. So, so like, how how do we how do we uh, how, I guess not how do we how do you how do you get people to kind of see past this? Because um, I know you you know my brother Alec. His big thing is really how do how do you utilize this? Because a lot of people are concerned about cheating. Is like you shouldn't be concerned about cheating. You should be more focused on how does this actually take changing or teaching. Like yeah. that should be the the big focus. So. You know, if you're, if you're going to block it right away, then you're, people can still get on their phones. Like it's not like you can't oh, no. have access to it. So like, mm -hmm. how are you getting people like to kind of shift their thinking on this, to go beyond, uh, the, one of the best analogies I heard about it is that use it as a second brain, like to kind of see oh, that. So yeah. how, how are you helping that, that shift, you know, kind of so that schools aren't blocking it. And I know you're doing this work already in your school district, but I know you're working with other schools and, and districts around uh, the world and having conversations, how are you getting them to kind of wrap their heads around it? I think the first part of what I always say is, and I don't like to use the word assessment. I really don't. But when you talk about assessment, if you are assessing the end product, let's call it an essay. That's a really easy example because AI could do that. If you're assessing the end product, AI can just do that. So I think what we need to really re- the, the area that we really need to think about is assessing the learning process. If you are checking in with your students, watching the learning evolve and guiding them throughout their learning process, and you could use project-based learning or flipped classroom or, I mean, any of the, the things we know work, um, you wouldn't be really concerned about cheating because you're I watching you're, you're watching the learning and you're watching that student develop and learn and grow. I think, you know, a lot of this has changed um, so quickly. So, you know, a lot of people, it is uh, March when this is, um, is being public or, you know, is being broadcast to the world. And so we're kind of going into that, you know, 
there's maybe a break. <laughs> there's maybe a break. And then we're like, you know, at the end where we're like, mm-hmm. man, these kids. I'm like, well, sometimes it's us as adults too. Like we're kind of done. Right. We're kind of done for the year too. So right. like, as people go into the end of the year, that, that final stretch, what's a piece of advice that you could give them as they're kind of looking to end, uh, end the year you know, on a, you know, a positive note um, for themselves and for their students? I think one thing that's always kind of just allowed me to stay focused um, and to finish strong during the school year is school year is just to um, for me to realize that this scholar only goes to this grade one time. Right. And so every, every day they only get this one day in, in fifth grade, sixth grade, fourth grade, whatever grade that scholar may be in one time. So we have to make the best of it. We have to finish strong. And once we're finished, you know, we're finished, but we have to we have to just realize that they only get one of these in their lifetime, right? So we have to give it all we got this one time for them. Now it may look different because we have to go back and do it all again, but not with that particular scholar. And mm-hmm. so I think if we hold on to that, you know what I'm saying? It keeps just what we do new and just fresh and to realize, you know what I'm saying? I would never get this opportunity with the same scholar again. So let me give it all I got and let me finish strong. And so I think that, um, or even when I deal with trainings or, or teachers, I may, I will not get the same opportunity again with this person. So in this moment, I'm going to give it everything that I have and I'm going to finish strong. So hopefully that encourages you <laughs> to finish the school year strong. Yeah. I love that. That's such good. And that's yeah. true, right? Like that. It, this is it. Mm-hmm. This is our only year mm-hmm. in grade three. This is it. This yeah. is our only yeah. year in grade three. So I love that. One of the things that I, I say with groups that are maybe, you know, they're banning devices still to this day in classrooms. The worst thing you can do is just say, hey, we're going to let you have devices tomorrow and teach the same way that you were teaching before, because now it's going to, you're going to lose. Like you're going to, but how do you get people to think differently about how they use that? And I think both of us learned that from a place of experience. Would you say that's fair? Yeah. And, and you said the key word value, you mm-hmm. know, or the, I, I think the greatest impact a leader can have, you know, leadership is not telling people what to do. It's taking them where they need to be. Mm-hmm. And nobody wants to be told what to do. I mean, you don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told what to do. But if the conditions are created where we see the value, then you know, change happens more through intrinsic motivation. You know, when I think about it wasn't just a challenge of me doing a 180 and saying, no devices. Oh, now we're gonna open the floodgates and do bring your own device. But then, you know, it was, how did I get my, how do I get my staff on board? Mm-hmm. And it took time to sh- help them see the value. So I, I think in, in leadership today, it's not about doing it all. It's about how do you help those that you serve, see the value in different ideas, perspectives, strategies. I, I try not to say new because a lot of the strategies might be new to a leader who's implementing for the first time, but they might not be necessarily right. you know, new. So I think what you said is that, again, how you help others see the value. But here's the thing. You, as a person with a title, if you're a leader, you first have to see the value in doing things mm-hmm. differently, doing things better, breaking free from the status quo or the mentality of that's the way we've always done it, or this, it's working. Why change it? Mm-hmm. And that comes back to just knowing that in education, change is a ongoing process. And there's always aspects where we can grow and improve. One of the things I do just kind of behind the scenes of the podcast, uh, I never just meet the guests and press record. We kind of just talk and I kind of learn. And we were talking about kind of focusing on learners, not just students. And seeing that as adults, and you, you said something really powerful, and I, I hope you can share with everyone here, because I think it's something that's really meaningful, especially in education today, where, you know, people are, there's a lot of people feeling very disillusioned with education, right? Uh, you wow. can see a lot of people are leaving the profession, but you talked about helping people find their purpose. And so can you talk a little bit about what you shared with me? Because I thought that was really powerful. And I think it's a really important message, especially in the world today. Well, I mean, um, in Carroll County, our vision is to be recognized as a, as a uh, premier school system. But we had had that out there for a number of years, and, it, it, and we still had a void. We had a gap. Uh, you know, we still 
didn't quite do what it needed to do. And so we get entered a discussion about, well, that's our vision. And when we got a mission, but what's our purpose? Why do we get up and come to work every day? You know, why do we uh, face the things that we face, deal with the issues we deal with or the problems or whatever it may be? You know, what's our purpose? And uh, so we had some deep discussion as a district. And at the end of the day, what we determined that our purpose is, is to positively change lives. Uh, so when we talk to our, our people, you know, we ask the question, you know, what are we doing today with, with every person we interface with to positively uh, impact that person, to make that life um, better, to enrich them, to lift them up or whatever it may be. So whether it's a student, a uh, fellow staff member, a parent or community member, it matters not. Uh, all of them deserve for us to give them the very best experience we can give them and to positively enrich their opportunity so that their trajectory in life is improved. Mm -hmm. So our purpose is to positively change lives. Uh, and that really is the statement of what we want our culture to be about here in Carroll County Schools.